Hey, thank you so much for joining us at our Cross Point Church podcast. Now, if you're new to our podcast or maybe new to our church in general, we're just a bunch of messed up people who don't have it all together, running after a heavenly leader who loves us and meets us right where we are. We hope this message encourages you, builds your faith, and strengthens your confidence as you continue down this journey of what it means to know and follow Jesus. Enjoy this message. All right. How about that? Um, I wish you all could have experienced what it felt like to be on this stage and how much it shook as that trailer played because it like kind of felt like a tornado was approaching us. It was pretty wild, but... Um, hey, welcome to Crosspoint. So excited that you are here with us tonight, whether you are in the room or joining us online this weekend. Let's make some noise for our online audience. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Uh, my name is Abby, if we've not met, and I'm super excited to get to be a part of this last week of this At The Movies 12 series together. And if this is your first time here with us, we really are serious about wanting to give you free movie tickets. Whether you're tuned in or you're here in the room, be sure to fully submit that connection card. Let us know a place where we can send those tickets your way. Uh, we would love to give you that hookup. And again, we're so glad that you're here. So throughout the last six weeks, whether you've been here or not, what we've been doing is we've been looking at the fibers of faith that are woven throughout some of this year's most popular films. And I'm really excited to unpack this one, Twisters. Uh, how, has anybody seen this yet? Okay, all right, awesome. Uh, so when Kurt kind of walked me through the different options of what movies we could go with for this weekend, I was immediately drawn to this one because, uh, well, first of all, Glenn Powell. I mean, come on, right? <laughs> I promise I'm not going to like keep bringing this up, but I just had to get it out of my system. So, okay, we're good. Um, I, I will say on so any Glenn Powell fans, anybody like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know there will be a fan here on Sunday because uh, this was the literal text exchange with my husband. After I walked out of that meeting, I texted him and said, hey, do you want to go see Twisters tomorrow night? I capitalized the S because it's been very confusing to me that the old movie was Twister and this one is Twisters. That's, so anyways, and his response was, heck yeah, I'd love to go see Glenn Powell. I mean, Twisters. <laughs> uh, gotta love the honesty. So, uh, you know, there's another reason, though, that I was drawn to this movie in particular, and it's because some of my earliest vivid memories actually revolve around the first Twister movie. How many of you seen, have seen this one? Make some noise if you, yeah, Twister fan. So when I was, I'm going to age myself here, when I was about four or five, my, this, this movie was pretty new and my family was in, on vacation in Florida. We had kind of a bad weather day and so they ended up watching this and I, I mean, I was pretty little so I don't think I watched really the whole movie but I saw enough of it to get a glimpse of what it was about and this is one of those memories that I had to go back and fact check because I've lived in Indiana my whole life and in my mind, every region kind of has just one natural disaster that they have to, to deal with. And so I thought Florida's lot was hurricanes, but apparently they get both. Uh, so congratulations, Florida. You get hurricanes, you get tornadoes, you get alligators, pythons, you know, but also beaches. So I get it. Uh, but uh, so what I do remember, I, I couldn't remember that exactly, but what I do remember is uh, that right after we watched this movie, there were literal hurricane threats in the area. And uh, I remember so clearly the feeling of fear that I had, as I realized that what we had just seen unfold on screen could actually come to life in the place where we were in that moment. I remember looking out the window and scanning for any sign of a tornado. And I'm guessing as you think back to some of your earliest memories, they probably, some, probably some of them are memories where you felt a fear like that probably about something different, but fear has this way of grabbing our attention, of causing us to notice and remember more vividly than we normally do. And this has a purpose, right? It, it does this so that we can learn from those experiences. We can learn how to avoid danger in the future. This is a gift that fear gives us. But like every emotion, there's gifts and then there's shadow sides. They're shadow sides that we have to learn how to control so that they don't end up controlling us. Just like Kurt unpacked a couple of weeks ago as we looked at Inside Out 2. And whether you've seen the movie Twisters or not, you probably aren't super surprised to learn that fear is a dominant theme throughout the movie. And so we're gonna be diving into this today. 
In the trailer, you heard a couple of lines, but for one, that iconic line, you don't face your fears, you ride them. I don't do it justice, but you know, I'm glad you get to hear him. But I do, I love that imagery. I love the imagery that dealing with fear is sometimes like climbing onto the back of a bull. There's this honesty, this grittiness with that image that paints a picture of dealing with fear as this ongoing process, this adventure perhaps even. And here's the reality about it, is that when we do, we don't know what will happen. We don't really get a guarantee about how it will go. But I actually think that this picture, this idea of not just facing our fears, but riding them, it's a picture that has a lot to do with the way that God teaches us to respond to fear. We're going to get to that in a bit. But first, I want to kind of highlight three main versions of fear that we see playing out in this movie, Twisters. First is the fear of what we cannot control. Now, we try not to do a lot of spoilers in this series, but I, I am going to give you one here. So spoiler alert if this bothers you. There are a lot of tornadoes in the movie Twisters. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, sometimes, at the, uh, several times, I found myself even saying out loud, like, why aren't they more afraid? Shouldn't they be more afraid than they are right now as they get up close to those storms? But what we do see over and over again is center stage are these moments when suddenly everything has changed. A storm sweeps in and life halts. Everything is quickly out of control. And I'm guessing you know this feeling. I know this feeling. Maybe you're in the midst of a moment like that right now, feeling like your whole life has been twisted up because of something that has happened so aware of the things that are out of your control. There's another form of fear that we see playing out in the movie and I think in our own lives too. And it's the fear that comes based on past experiences. See, at the center of Twisters is this character, Kate Carter, played by Daisy Edgar Jones. And she's this meteorologist who's living with the lingering effects of a trauma she experienced, a tornado run in years earlier that that went horribly wrong. And again, the fear of past experience, I think this is something that, that we all know in big and small ways in our lives. This is one of those rare struggles that actually gets perhaps more difficult to deal with the older we get. When I spend time with students, I often say, hey, I I promise that that actually gets easier as as you experience some more of life. But the truth is, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the more we experience, the more we find ourselves crippled with the fear of, of what if that happens again? Yesterday, I was hanging out with some of my extended family and had, saw kind of just a little picture of this as I was sitting with my grandma and she was telling me all these horror stories about things that I should be more worried about as a parent of young kids. And meanwhile, my two-year-old who is fearless is just like bulldozing into every hazardous thing she could find. Like she's creating danger out of things that shouldn't even be dangerous. And it's, it's the difference of, of where we are in our lives. The older we get the more we have to be intentional to do some work so that we don't let this kind of fear dominate us. There's a third category of fear that we see play out in the movie Twisters, and it's the fear of the other. See, when Kate arrives on the scene in Oklahoma, she grew up there and then she's been away in New York City and she comes back And when she shows up, she discovers that there are these two very distinct camps of people who are chasing these storms. You saw a glimpse of this in the trailer. There are the scientists who she has come to join. And then there is this rowdy YouTube gang. The YouTuber gang is led by Tyler Owens, Glenn Powell's character, and he immediately rubs Kate the wrong way with his seemingly self-centered, reckless demeanor, the way he puts his face on t-shirts and seems to be profiting off of other people's tragedies. Now, eventually you find out that both of these groups have been drawn to Oklahoma out of a desire to help people who are impacted by these tornadoes. And 
Both of the groups hold these fears that the other group is actually doing more harm than good in the process. That sounds familiar. You know, the, the truth is the fear of the other, fearing other groups of people really is a version of fearing what is out of our control, right? We want so badly sometimes to be able to control other people, to just be able to convince them to see things our way, but we can't. Fear based in the past, on past experiences is really a version of fearing what we can't control too, right? We think that if we just try hard enough to safeguard ourselves against past hurts, that somehow we'll gain the ability to control the future a little bit more than we could the past. But it doesn't really work that way. Fear and the desire for control are so often interconnected. We see it in most of our parenting fears, really in all of our relationships. Often this is the thing that keeps us from, from moving to a place where we're able to fully open up with one another. Many of our political opinions are rooted in this kind of fear. Often our ambitions can be traced back to this. We feel like if we could just get to a certain level, then we'll feel like we have a little more control of our lives. So in the spirit of Twisters, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a couple of storm stories that help us figure out how do we navigate when we are facing fear about what is out of our control. There are actually quite a few storm stories that we find throughout the collection of writings that we now call the Bible. We actually looked at one of them last week and can't encourage you enough to go back, check that out if you haven't yet, if you missed it. But there's this one ancient storm story that has all of these forms of fear present that we just talked about from the movie. Fear of not being in control, fear based on past experiences, fear of the, uh, this other group of people. And if you grew up around church, this may have been a story that you heard quite a bit when you were a kid. Though I'm guessing you probably haven't heard, heard a whole lot about it since then. If you didn't grow up in church, this may be a story that you've heard some things about, but probably just some of the bizarre parts. This really is a pretty wild story. It's a story about a guy named Jonah. Now, for me, as a young kid, when I first learned about Jonah, I learned that Jonah got swallowed by this big fish. Actually, I think I was taught whale, but really whale's not in there. And, uh, but, but, you know, the point was I had no idea why it mattered. It just made a fun coloring page, right? Anybody else uh, remember the fun Jonah coloring pages? Uh, but, you know, then I got a little older. And here's the message that I started to hear when I thought about Jonah's story. I thought what Jonah was meant to teach us is that if you listen to what God is asking you to do, then God will send you to the very last place that you want to go. And if you don't obey, he will hunt you down. <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. And that was a little closer, but not at all the point of the story. Then, later on, this story made it onto a list for me of parts of the Bible that I mostly avoided because I just couldn't rationally wrap my mind around it. How could a man be, stay alive in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights and then just be spit back out onto dry land? And truthfully, this is where most of our conversation begins and ends when it comes to Jonah. Because there are some people who are very adamant that this was a historical event and that it is so important that we see it that way. And then there are other people who are very adamant that this story was never meant to be read, read as history because it's clearly written in the form of a fable. But here's the problem with this debate. When we get caught in the weeds trying to decide what we think about that, what happens is we miss the point of the story. We miss the reason that this story has actually been preserved for hundreds and thousands of years. It causes us to miss what might be one of the most important books in the Old Testament. So to really understand Jonah, we have to actually understand how it would have been received by the people who first heard this story. We have to understand that there was this long history of animosity between Jonah's people and this other group, the Assyrians. 
See, Assyria was a powerhouse of oppression, especially for the people of Israel. Assyria had invaded their land, deported their people, set up a siege around their city that caused many of them to suffer and die. You can think of it almost like the animosity between to today's Israel and Palestine, except the difference is Israel in that day had no ability to defend itself. It was this tiny kingdom facing a global superpower. And it's during this era of history that a story emerges about a man named Jonah, an Israelite who God calls to take a message to the city of Nineveh. And Nineveh is right in the heart of, you guessed it, Assyria. Jonah wants nothing to do with that. And so he heads to the nearest port, he jumps on a ship, and he sails off in the opposite direction. The text tells us that he was headed toward modern-day Spain, which would have literally been the opposite end of the world as they knew it. He was trying to go as far as he possibly could away from that place. And of course he does. Of course you don't go there. His response is exactly what they, the people who first heard the story, would have been expecting him to do. Exactly what they likely would have done too. See, they would have come into this story operating with the assumption that Jonah was the hero and Assyria were the villains. But as the story continues to unfold, what we see is that no one fits into these neat categories where they should fit. Jonah, the good guy, is running from God, ends up on this downward spiral. The ship that he's on gets overtaken by the storm, threatening its safety. And when it does, these heathen sailors respond by trying everything they can to save Jonah, even beginning to pray while Jonah sleeps and shrinks in fear. It's at this point that Jonah gets tossed overboard and swallowed by the fish, spends three days and nights there before being vomited back onto dry land. And then he's like, okay, I guess I'll try going to Nineveh. Then what happens is the most shocking piece of all, the response that he gets when he gets there. See, the Assyrians, these people who everyone believed was beyond redemption, are actually open to being changed. They listen to what Jonah has to say, and they turn toward God. And this is where we get the point of this story. This whole story is designed to help us see that in God's economy, there is no other it's meant to blast apart our biases and our labels with a declaration that God is on everyone's side. That it is in God's nature to extend love and grace, especially to those who we have decided are not on God's side. See, Jonah had this fear of facing those people that was understandable, perhaps even wise, based on what he had experienced in the past but when he finally ends up in the place where he'd been avoiding, the place that he feared, it turns out there was actually more to fear in the places where he'd gone running away, the places where he'd been avoiding the mission, than within the mission itself. He experienced what you've probably experienced too, that when you get in proximity with people who you feel like you probably have nothing in common with, perhaps even people you don't like, in Jonah's case, people you despise, that you end up discovering there are layers you didn't expect. There's more to their story than what you'd assumed. In Twisters, Kate's initial impression of Tyler and his rowdy YouTuber group is that they were just there to get attention, to get famous, and that they are getting in the way of the people who are actually trying to do good. But as she starts to spend time with them and get to know them, she discovers that there are so many more layers of what's going on with them. She begins to see how what they are doing actually is helping vulnerable people. 
And in the process, she begins to see some of the blind spots that she didn't notice before within her own group. See, her story and Jonah's story are cautionary tales about what we can miss when we allow fear to shape our assumptions of one another. Fear can be such a powerful tool of division. And the people vying for our votes this November, they understand this. They're experts at preying on our fears, at leading us to places where we divide ourselves in camps to teach us to see one another as the other. And what's happening in Jonah that's echoed so many places throughout the story of God, is God is initiating this invitation to his people to rise above that instinct. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, all right, if you're gonna open the politics can of worms, there's a lot more that needs to be said there. Um, We agree with you completely, and we hope that you'll come back next week as we start this new series, Not In It To Win It, where we're going to dive a lot deeper than this into what to do with that often messy and confusing intersection between faith and politics, especially in times like these. So if you want to talk more about that, I hope you'll come back and join us over the next two weeks. If you don't want to talk more about that, uh, I hope you'll, you'll come back and you'll give it a shot anyways. You may be surprised. Before we move on from from Jonah's story, there's another interesting layer that I wanna make sure that we don't miss. See, at the end of it all, after Jonah has been a part of this amazing movement of watching this city turn toward God, change the direction of their lives because of what Jonah has said to them, we might expect Jonah to be like, wow, I'm so glad that I ended up making it here. How amazing to get to be a part of that. But that's not what Jonah does. Look at how he actually responds. It says, but to Jonah, this, this being God's mercy toward the Assyrians, seemed wrong. And he got angry. He complained to God saying, didn't I say before I left home that you would do this? This is why I ran away. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Whoa. And then this book just ends. We don't know if Jonah ever comes around to a different perspective. It just leaves these questions hanging in the air, questions that God asks of Jonah. Is it right for you to be angry? Should I not have concern for Nineveh? And here's why it does this. This whole story is meant to not really even be about Jonah, but to be about us. It's meant to hold up a mirror for us to consider. Does my heart line up with the compassionate and gracious heart of God? It leaves us to wrestle with questions like, can I forgive my worst enemy? And not only that, but can I actually go a step further and become a channel through which they might experience God's love? Questions like, can I move on from my past, or does the past decide the future? There's this one scene in Twisters when Kate is all caught up in the past. She's resistant to try again something that she really loved, something that she believed could make a difference because of the way that everything spun out of control the last time. And so Tyler begins to talk to her about the EF scale, the scale that's used to rate the severity of tornadoes. He says to her, you know, that the E1, E5 rating, it's not really based on wind speed like most people think. It's based on damage. It's only after the fact that a tornado is rated. 
I looked into this and it really is true. There is no tool that's capable of accurately predicting the strength of a tornado or of even measuring it as it's happening. And so while on the news, when we hear about these, these scale and, and we hear a lot about wind speeds, really it's the damage that's left behind that determines where a tornado falls on that scale. After he explains all of this, Tyler turns to Kate and he says, so how much more are you gonna let this take from you? How much more will you let it take from you? I wonder if this is a question that you might need to wrestle with. As you consider the way that your fears have been keeping you from moving on, moving forward. See, sometimes our fear can cause us to live in the wreckage for too long, perhaps even to increase the damage. Because every time you avoid something that you are afraid of, you reinforce that fear. You tell your brain, yeah, that is something that we should be afraid of. And sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes our avoidance is allowing fear to take even more from us than it already has. When I was in college, I spent a week in Oklahoma, and part of that trip was designed to, to be involved in some tor a tornado cleanup project. It was just after a really devastating storm had hit more Oklahoma. And so one day we showed up to a neighborhood like this and were tasked with beginning to clear out the rubble to make room for the homeowners to be able to rebuild. And I remember standing among it and just being so stunned, trying to imagine what it must have been like for those families to have just, in the blink of an eye, lost everything, had, had their lives totally upended, stunned by the little remnants of things that looked normal in the midst of so much destruction. And most of all, what I remember is how I felt as I listened to the stories of the people who lived there. Many of them stories of people for whom this was not the first tornado that they had weathered. And I tried to wrap my mind around why they would stay. Didn't they know there were a lot of other places in the world where they could move, where this perhaps wouldn't happen again and again? Looking back, I think that their life experiences had taught them something that perhaps we all need to learn at some point along the way that there are these opposing truths that we must hold at the same time. That on the one hand, there are things that I can not control. And I can rebuild. I have the capacity. It's this balance between surrender and agency. This is what is required for us to ride our fears in a direction worth going. And if, as we're talking about this, you're realizing, yeah, I might, I might need a little more of that balance in my life. I, I might need to spend some time evaluating my relationship to fear and specifically the way that my desire for control plays into that, then I would encourage you to hit this QR code and uh, it's gonna send you to a download that will guide you through a three-step process. And uh, really what you need to do is just set aside about 15, 20 minutes and what it will do is help you to reflect on your relationship between fear and a desire for control. And then to begin to look at your patterns of response. Where are some of the places that, that you're getting tripped up over and over again? And then finally, it will help you to craft an experiment, something that you can try for a limited amount of time that may actually move the needle to take you to new places. Check that out if, if you're interested in diving deeper in this. As we get ready to wrap up today, I wanna to circle back and connect the dots on how the don't face your fears, just ride them comment intersects with the way that Jesus actually taught us to deal with fear. See, there's this other storm story, this day where Jesus sets out on a boat with his closest friends. It had been a long taxing day. 
And so Jesus lays down and he takes a nap. And while he's asleep, this storm develops, starts to fill the boat with water. It's, it's whipping them all around and, and his friends begin to panic. They wake Jesus up and they say, we're about to drown, help us. Jesus wakes up casually with the word, calms the storm. And then he turns and he asks them, where is your faith? Now, sometimes I've struggled with this question, like, what, what, what exactly is he getting at here? You know, he's not saying that if they had faith, there wouldn't have been a storm. I mean, he's got faith and he's in the boat with them. He's not saying that if they had just had enough faith, they could have stilled the storm themselves. He's not yet sent them out, not yet invited them to even try to do those kinds of things. What Jesus is doing and asking them this question, it's this quick hand way of addressing their focus. He's reminding them, hey, remember, you've been with me long enough. You've seen enough of what I can do. You've experienced enough to know that you can trust me. Maybe some of us need a reminder today that we already have adequate grounds to trust God in the midst of the storm that we're facing. See, in the same way that our past experiences can fuel our fears, our past experiences also have the capacity to fuel our faith, to fuel our ability to trust. And we see this play out with the disciples. See, just a little later on, there was another day when they got into a boat this time without Jesus. And when they got out on the water again, the wind picks up and again, they're terrified. But this time for a different reason. This time they're not afraid of the storm. This time they're terrified because they see this figure coming toward them on the water. They think it's a ghost, but it's Jesus. And he says to them, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. See, by this point, they had seen what Jesus could do with a storm. And it seems that now they're just a little more ready to trust. At least Peter is, for sure. He asked Jesus, hey, that looks fun. Can I come out there too? And Jesus says, come. Peter steps out onto the water. He takes this bold, brave step, focuses his attention on Jesus, and begins to walk his way. But then there's this moment where his focus shifts. He, he gets caught up by the wind and the waves and the storm around him, and he starts to sink. But Jesus, as Jesus does, reaches in, and he picks him up. See, this is how Jesus teaches his followers, not just to face their fears, but to ride them. He keeps beckoning them just a bit further, time by time, knowing that sometimes fear would take over, and that's okay. But also knowing that it's in those moments where they have to make a decision, am I gonna take another step? that they would have actually have the opportunity to experience that Jesus is worth trusting. That those experiences would build upon each other over time and eventually would become the foundation for them to become people who could take risks, who could take steps that they never would have been able to dream they would take when they were cowering on that boat. See, this is what God wants to do in us too. In the midst of our own storms, in the places where our life is all twisted up, where we are consumed with the things that are out of our control, what God wants to do is for us to look towards Him so that He can remind us we are never on our own. And despite the fact that there will always be things that we cannot control, we can choose where to focus. We can trust to take a step in God's direction 
knowing that it is always a step worth taking. I invite you to go ahead and stand and uh, I'm gonna pray for us as we get ready to sing one more song. God, in these next few moments, these final moments that we have together, as we sing these words, this anthem over our fears, God, I pray that you would meet us here, that you would reveal to us the things that you are longing for us to see in the midst of our fear, longing for us to see about our relationship with control. Help us to know that we are not alone and to have the courage to take a step in your direction, whether it's for the very first time or just another step. Make this a moment that builds our trust instead of building our fear. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. Take a moment to follow our podcast on your preferred platform and be sure to download our app to stay informed on everything happening here at Crosspoint. And if you like what you heard today, don't hesitate to share it with a friend that might need to hear it too.